This week on The Travel Show. What's in store for the year ahead? I think a phrase lots of us can expect to hear in 2021 is documents, please. The world's tallest mountain. I really hope that the people who want to go and climb Mount Everest really understand the significance of this mountain, the sacredness of this mountain. I thought I'd seen everything. And a detox that's not for the squeamish. <laughs> wow. The visual of it is the most shocking part. Hello and welcome to the show. After a dramatic year, I'm here in Turkey to start my 2021 off on a little bit more of a restful note with some strange alternative therapies. And if you haven't heard of what Mad Honey is, stay tuned for that. But first. After a tumultuous year for travel, 2021 has got off to a gloomy start in the UK with pretty much the entire country now being back in lockdown. But with a vaccine just starting to be rolled out, can we begin to see the light at the end of the tunnel and start to build some idea of what the year ahead might look like for those who are desperate to travel? Rajan's been finding out. Last year, as we all stayed home and talked to our computers, much of the outside world fell eerily quiet. The latest data from the World Tourism Organization says that between January and October 2020, global destinations welcomed 900 million fewer international tourists than in the same period the year before. And they believe that last year as a whole will have set tourism levels back to that of three decades ago. And while that means we've all missed out on our cherished holidays, for the travel industry, it spells a loss of an estimated one trillion US dollars plus. Now that's cash that could have gone on the costs and wages of airlines, hotels, local taxis, guides, you name it. It all means that 2021 is going to start like no other year. And an awful lot is riding on it. We're going to be looking at a slow and possibly slightly nervous start. The effect of this pandemic will actually be people appreciating how important travel is to them and the world we live in. Cities are out of favour at the moment because they're busy or will be busy again after the pandemic. So it's going to turn a whole new generation of people into global nomads. We're probably going to see prices go up. 2021 is looking like a real bumper year for travel. And now is the time we all usually start making those holiday plans for the year. But the way we choose to book might change. Our research finds that people are increasingly turning to travel agents to book their future holidays. I think they really value the professionalism and expertise. The higher end is going to be promoting, you know, a more secure and safe environment with larger expansive rooms and everything's been cleaned immaculately well and, and really pushing that high end safe aspect. And then you're going to have these great offers that are just super cheap. And don't forget the availability of vaccines should be a game changer. We're now rolling out the biggest vaccination program in our history. The places that get their act together and vaccinate the general population are going to actually see a short-term boost in, in attracting visitors as, as a safe place. We'll find ways to boost the pace of vaccination. Crucially, what we don't know at the moment is whether the vaccine uh, prevents you from transmitting the disease. That is going to be really crucial for holidays because even if you've been vaccinated and you can still transmit the disease, well, countries aren't going to want to let you in. But for travellers, it's going to be an important step towards booking with confidence. When the vaccine news for the Pfizer vaccine came out in December, we saw a 37% increase in searches and bookings. Once travel does open up again, the trips we actually take might also change. People haven't taken all their holiday allowance in 2020, and ultimately people are looking to use that um, in new and different ways. Activity holidays, I think, will, will benefit very much from the, the collective experience that people have been through. 
higher demand, more passengers seeking to go to fewer places because the airlines won't have as many aircraft to fly to traditional places. All these places from Barcelona to Dubrovnik and Venice that are typically just swarm with tourists are going to say, hey, come now while there's no one here. And as the fears start to drop, people are going to swarm back in. We will be encouraged to see other places in those countries, go to other beaches, other national parks, other cities. I think that's fantastic. It, it spreads the wealth of tourism. The COVID impact has made people understand the nuances a little better of sustainable tourism. So, you know, previously people might have thought about sustainable tourism, then the first thing they might have thought about is aviation and the impact of aviation. Now they're aware, actually, it's about communities, it's about conservation. And within a holiday, it's not just aviation, it's accommodation, it's tours and activities, it's food procurement, it's all the supply chains that come into it. And when we do travel this year, what's it going to be like? I think a phrase lots of us can expect to hear in 2021 is documents, please. Uh, that may be your vaccination certificate or it may be your proof of a test. Using uh, biometrics or facial or voice recognition to smoothly get your check-in, get your security, get to the plane, board the plane, not touching anyone and not hand handing documents over and then even getting to your hotel and using biometrics for that. I think that's the one piece of technology that's going to speed up things, reduce congestion and make people feel safer. Of course, there is one man who's been through this with us every step of the way. Simon, hello. In terms of, of travel, when it does get going in 2021, wh wh what do you foresee? I'm braced to pay quite a lot more. While there are certainly some bargains around, I'm just looking at early March, a one-way ticket to Athens, 1,500 miles for eight pounds, it's ridiculous. But generally for the sorts of holidays and flights that you were getting a couple of years ago, I'd be prepared to pay 25, maybe even 50% more. And of course, we have now fully left the European Union. The Brexit transition phase is over. So lots of restrictions, particularly to do with passport validity. Well, in that case, are there any reasons to be cheerful about 2021, Simon? So many reasons to be cheerful. In Northern Ireland, you've got the Game of Thrones studio tour opening up. And I think perhaps the greatest cultural event of the 2020s will be in Egypt the Grand Egyptian Museum, just by the pyramids outside Cairo. That is going to be a momentous occasion. I can't wait to be there. Neither can I. Let's hope that happens very soon. Thank you, Simon. Stick around, because we've got some great stuff coming up next. The world's tallest mountain. Ever since I was a kid, I dreamed of climbing Mount Everest. Look at that. And the honey with a sting in its tail. I've got my mad honey. I'm a little bit anxious. <laughs> Next this week, a visit to the world's tallest mountain. Mount Everest was closed for much of 2020 because of the pandemic. But could the lockdown have been a blessing in disguise for this ultimate adventure destination? The Sherpas are an ethnic group from northeastern Nepal, and uh, the Himalayas is home for us. Ever since I was a kid, I dreamed of climbing Mount Everest. I've been on 13 Mount Everest expeditions. Uh, the Mount Everest uh, is where our goddess Nialong Sangma resides. It's a sacred mountain. For me, it's a very magical place. Uh, I've got enormous reverence and respect for Mount Everest. Uh, I've seen how beautiful and magic it can be, but I've also seen the, the tragedy, the death that can result from being on Everest. In the 1950s, there were only like four or five Western tourists who came into the Everest region. By 2019, we had thousands, uh, more than 35,000 tourists who came to the Everest region. And to put that in perspective, this is a region with around 7,000 people. So it's five times the actual population who lives there. In 2019, nearly 900 people reached the mountain summit. But bad weather and a short window to reach the peak led to it being one of the deadliest seasons on record with at least 11 casualties. 
some of the slower climbers held up climbers behind them. So the slowest person dictated the pace. Fortunately, because our team's skill level was high enough, we could climb around others that were stuck. So we were able to stay on schedule, got to the top, and then came down back to high camp. I think something was lost there. It became all about who's going to get there, how fast, and what am I going to get out of that experience. And I suspect that it's only going to get worse in the future, unless there is an intervention. Although the Nepalese government collects an 8,000 pound fee from four mountaineers, until now, there has been little regulation on tour operators or climbers' skill level. Over the last 10 or 15 years, um, the peak has become uh, more accessible to climbers with a lower skill set or, or, or less experience um, because companies are offering trips to Everest and, and not requiring um, a certain level of, of mountaineering experience and skill to join. And with more mountaineers, another problem has emerged. Some have begun calling Mount Everest the world's highest garbage dump. After the crowded 2019 season, officials embarked on a massive cleaning expedition, bringing over 10,000 kilos of garbage down from the mountain. But there's still more to be done. But Nepal isn't a wealthy country, so balancing environmental issues with Everest's economic impact can be difficult. While the government wants to increase the amount of people visiting each year, there are plans to put new rules on who's allowed to summit the world's highest peak. Mount Everest or na aunu banda poili, ulle komse kum 5000-6000 meter ka aru Himal aru aron gari ko unu paru. Tesu unda ulle bani uncha, u sokcha, saasi uncha. I khal ka ke niyam aru, ami jane banong dey chonda. Ab aron dollar lai anumati din da pani, unda ko sapai yu kya ko profile hai aur matay anumati din chon. I think requiring uh, potential Everest climbers to have previously climbed. 6,000 meter peak is a great idea. And also the, the guiding companies, I think should be held to, to some standard. Responsibility lies on the individual who's choosing to go to Everest to ensure that they are properly prepared. I feel that the uh, perception of the mountain being so crowded is false. The mountain does not feel like that at all. It's, it's vast, it's open. If anyone's dreaming of climbing Everest, I think they should do it. It's not just a rich person's sport. They should start climbing peaks closer to home and work their way up, climbing bigger and bigger mountains with harder terrain, and eventually find their way to the top of the world. The Sherpas in the Everest region are ready for tourists to come. I really hope that the people who want to go and climb Mount Everest really understand the significance of this mountain, the sacredness of this mountain. And finally this week, I'm in Turkey, which has mostly remained open to tourists throughout the coronavirus crisis. Travel is big business here, bringing in around $35 billion in 2019, a figure that took a big dent last year. But pre-pandemic, there was a particular kind of tourism on the rise. 
and that's medical tourism. Foreigners coming here for treatment, lured by the promise of good quality health care at an affordable price. Procedures range from the cosmetic to the life-saving, from hair replacement to cancer treatment. In 2019, the Turkish government said 660,000 people came here for medical reasons, 20% more than the previous year. But I'm not here for surgery. I'm here to de-stress and unwind after a bumpy 2020 and start the new year in the right frame of mind. So I'm looking for some alternative therapies that have the roots deep in Turkish tradition. My journey begins in Rize province, the region famous for its tea. Let me zip up. But today, I'm going to try something just a little bit more potent. Oh, look at that. <laughs> wow, it's so heavy. <laughs> look at this. This is Deli Bao, otherwise known as Mad Honey. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Tell me, what makes this honey different than other honey? Arılar, orman gülü, kırmızı Deli Bal'dan aldıkları çiçeklerden bu balı üretir. Dünyanın sadece Himalaya bölgesinde var, bir de Karadeniz'de var orman gülünden. Bunun içerisinde bulunan granatoksin maddesi, yani insanların nabzını düşüren, tansiyonunu düşüren bir özelliğe sahiptir. Its use has been traced back to ancient times. Here, it's used as a local remedy for hypertension and other conditions. But it has to be taken in small amounts. Too much can drop your blood pressure to dangerous levels and even cause hallucinations. We're going to do this the safe way and the local way. If I'm not careful, I could be among the dozens of people admitted to hospital each year with mad honey poisoning. One teaspoon right on top. Oh, I'm a little bit anxious. <laughs> OK. And down the hatch. You should always exercise caution around this stuff in order to stay safe. It tastes great. There's a taste, it's a, mmm, what is that? More floral than honey? It's really tasty. Thankfully, I'm not having a bad reaction. Well, at least not yet. But then if the next segment's a bit wonky, <laughs> you know why. <laughs> but we're fine. Thanks so much. That was great. Over 800 miles away in Istanbul, you might stumble across our next therapy at a local bazaar. I thought I'd seen everything. It's called harutotherapy. Medicinal leeches are placed on a patient's body to purify the blood. The treatment has been around since ancient Egypt and was particularly popular in Europe in the early 19th century, before it was brought to Turkey. Uh, <laughs> well, so right before they bite, you can see their nose flattened down. You don't feel anything, do you? Because they have uh, anesthetic, a natural anesthetic. Yes. Yes. Just the, the visual of it is the most shocking part. Oh, there's a little, there's a little twinge, a little like tickle, yes. a little itch. We saw leeches at the market earlier. Yes, but it, this uh, leeches is very harmful uh, because maybe m harmful mi Micro microbe, uh, yeah, bacteria, like bacteria and yeah. virus. So these ones all came from, from a farm, farm where you... Where yes, you we have, we have uh, a leech farm. So there's a distinction between the legitimate uses of herutotherapy for medicine, which is to stop blood clotting, to clean wounds, and from bloodletting. Traditionally, bloodletting was thought to cure illness by balancing the humors, but it's long been discredited by doctors. And so what are, the, what are some of the things people would come to you for? Generally, heart disease, metabolic chronic disease, some contraction of muscles. Uh, like spasms or uh, something. For a healthy adult like myself, there's probably not much this gruesome therapy can do for me. 
if I'm going to shake off the stress of 2020, I'm going to have to try something just a little bit more soothing. Sound is a very powerful modality because it, it brings all the attention to something which is external. It somehow brings you into a moment that you're actually experiencing focus. Sound healing is deeply rooted in Turkish culture because during the Ottoman time they kind of combined the tradition from Chinese and Indian with the, with the ancient Turkic understanding um, which was deeply rooted in the shamanism culture. And uh, they brought everything together and they actually practiced it in the hospital. At one historic hospital in Adirna, music and natural sound was used to cure patients. Today, sound therapy is practiced in intense one-on-one -on -one sessions or as a group sound shower. And whenever you're ready, you can slowly open your eyes. <sighs> I don't know what it is about those singing bowls, but you you feel it in, in your body. And of all the therapies we've done, I think, I'll take a little bit more of this one, if you don't mind. <laughs> Just give me five more minutes. Just let me lay here. There we go. Oh, well, after all that, I'm feeling very relaxed, so I might go explore the city just a little bit more, but unfortunately, that'll mark the end of our adventures this week. But coming up next week... Carmen's here with a look back at some of our favorite adventures from Southeast Asia. From Henry's trip on Cambodia's wildest railway... This is a bridge! ...to Rajan's stunning journey through Myanmar, and my exploration of Manila from the back of a jeepney. When you want to tell the driver to stop, stop on the roof. So let's go? No, that's stop. That's stop? So make sure not to miss it. Remember, you can join us on social media by following us on all the regular social platforms. But for me, Mike Corey, and the rest of the Travel Show team here in Istanbul, it's goodbye.